Welcome to Politicus, the only podcast that discusses politics and public service from the Portuguese American perspective. Here we discuss everything from federal policy, local issues, and U.S. Portugal relations with the goal of driving more discussion and awareness of the issues affecting our nation, our community, and what we as Portuguese Americans can do about it. And now, Politicus. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Politicus. My name is Angela Samos, and I am here with Denise Borges. Hi, Denise. Hello, Angela. How are you? I'm doing all right. It's been a while since we've recorded an episode, so we're back at it. And today we have somebody, and I'm actually very excited because they're with the CDC, and I've never met anybody that works with the CDC. Uh, and so we have lots of great questions. And so let's bring Nancy Andrade into the conversation. Hi, Nancy. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Happy to be here with you all. So for our listeners, Nancy is a health scientist with the CDC, Center for Disease Control. And let's just jump right in. And Nancy, why don't you just tell us how you got involved with the CDC, your role, and a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, So I have a a pretty roundabout journey that has brought me to where I am now working for the Centers uh, for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. But my journey started and my Portuguese journey started in the late 70s. So my parents are originally from central Portugal. They're from the district of Guarda and they immigrated to southern New England to work in textile mills. So I grew up in Pawtucket, Rhode Island and also in Seekonk, Massachusetts. Uh, my parents um, brought us up speaking Portuguese. I was pretty involved in the Portuguese community, going to a Portuguese church. My cousin were involved in folklore dancing. And being an immigrant kid, my parents really emphasized school and um, working hard. And they definitely sacrificed a lot for my sister and I. And so they instilled in us kind of a pressure that we always had to do well in school and to excel. So I really think my parents, well, for several things, but one of the things is growing up in a bicultural household, I really came to be interested in other cultures, not just my Portuguese culture. So I I attribute a lot to being Portuguese. And one of the things I attribute is actually getting a scholarship to Providence College. So I got a multicultural scholarship for students from other backgrounds. And while I was at Providence College, I majored in global studies. I was really interested first in European history and politics. And then I also had a Spanish major. And so I became, I learned a bit more about colonial history. And unfortunately, uh, Spain and Portugal uh, had some difficulties there in terms of how they treated people in their colonies. And so then I kind of got more interested in social justice and public service. And all of the experiences I've had since my college days have been focused on serving other people, serving underprivileged populations, and trying to make the world a better place. So I I studied abroad in Spain when I was at in Providence College, and I got to go to Portugal a few times. Um, And luckily, growing up speaking Portuguese really helped me uh, learn Spanish. And so after undergrad, I uh, did some work in Latin America. So I spent a few months in Nicaragua and Peru, and then a year in Argentina working with community-based organizations. So I really liked that grassroots work. We worked on community development, human rights, um, environmental work, health. And I was kind of always interested in health as a way to to serve people and make people's lives better. But I'm kind of a generalist in that I have a lot of interests. And so um, I didn't want to focus on it. But doing that grassroots work, I realized that you can only get so far in terms of building and changing communities without change in policy. And so I uh, went to get a master of public administration at Syracuse University. And then after that, I wanted to get some experience in government. I had done nonprofit work. And so I heard about this fellowship at CDC where you could work one year um, at the CDC headquarters and then two years with the state or local health department. So I did that. I did the one year in Atlanta and then I went to a very frigid uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota and worked there for two years. And then I came back to work at CDC and, um, Currently, I am actually doing kind of a temporary positions at at CDC where I'm working on reducing sodium in foods. But before that, 
Most recently, I was working in the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, working on tribal health, also working with our Division of Cancer Prevention. And one of the great opportunities or some of the great opportunities I've had through working at CDC is actually being able to work internationally. So I've worked on several disease outbreaks in Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries. So that's another thing that is really uh, my Portuguese background has really been valuable. I've worked um, for a few months in Angola, Mozambique, Puerto Rico, and Equatorial Guinea. So that's my kind of convoluted journey to where I am now. Wow. That's uh, pretty amazing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know where to go next. You've done so much in such a short amount of time. So what about your your current role? Because uh, I see you're, you focus on policy now, mm-hmm. and you made the point about being able to affect real change, you have to get into policy. So can you tell us a little bit about what that means? And maybe one of the, you said you were working on reducing sodium in food. So how do, how do you go about doing that? And what kind of policy work is involved with that? Sure. Um, So I work at the federal level. And from having worked for city government in Minneapolis, I think that most change happens at the local level, um, especially policy change. So at the federal level, what we kind of do is a lot more like policy analysis, like providing resources to our state and local governments. And then we also deal with our funders, which is Congress. So Congress appropriates funding to federal agencies like the CDC who are in the executive branch of the government. Um, But right now, in terms of the sodium reduction, it's uh, working with with local or or state governments to um, implement initiatives that will help entities like hospitals, schools to reduce sodium. So some of those things involve like changing the food environment. So for example, if you go into to a university cafeteria, the like lower sodium foods would be at eye level where you would most likely look and not be like at the bottom of the shelf. Mm. Also doing things like modifying recipes. So there's some sauces and things that have a lot of sodium, like for example, tomato sauce or soy sauce. So putting less sodium in those sauces. Just for your background, um, a lot of the sodium that Americans consume is from processed foods. So the recommendation is that Americans consume 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day, but the average is really 3,400. So we're trying to work with our local partners to reduce sodium in food. Um, And one of the What sodium does is it can lead to hypertension. Um, So through that, trying to also reduce people's risk of heart attack and stroke. And Nancy, one of the things that uh, drove you, I read, and we will have obviously a link from Palkus to this um, great story that is done on the Syracuse uh, website about your involvement in CDC. And one of the uh, great quotes that you have uh, in this uh, most awesome uh, article is that you say, despite some of the, and I'm quoting now, despite some of the unfortunate rhetoric out there, federal employees are doing critical work that improves people's lives on a daily basis. There are many opportunities for mentorship, growth, and development in the public sector. So um, you've talked a little bit about that in your intro, about what drove you and how your background kind of shaped that as well. I'm sure there's lots of Portuguese Americans, especially young Portuguese Americans in college or ready to get into college or finishing up and deciding maybe something to do with a master's program. What would you, as in a way of a mentorship, what kind of words or what kind of advice could you give them as uh, in, if they're thinking about going into the public sector and what federal employees do, actually? Sure. So I think sometimes people think, and you know, there there might be truth to this sometimes, that the federal government isn't very innovative, that things move slowly, which can be true. However, um, one of the things that really motivated me to go into like public service and the public sector is trying to impact as many people's lives as possible. And I felt that working in public health was a good way to do that. I mean, now I kind of realize that people's health is affected by a lot of things, not just their individual behaviors, but, you know, if they have a job, what their socioeconomic status is, um, that sort of thing. But um, I think there's 
I, I guess I can just speak from my experience working in local mm-hmm. government and then at CDC, there's a lot of people sort of like baby boomers and the generation after them that are really interested in, in mentoring the new cohort. And there'll be a lot of people retiring in the next, you know, five to 10 years. So I think there'll be a lot of opportunities for young people. And I think one of the cool things, especially about the federal government, is that we do have opportunities to work in a lot of different areas. So as I mentioned, I'm on a temporary assignment right now, and we call those details, which uh, many federal agencies will let you do. And it's basically doing a short-term assignment in another division or unit so you can get different types of experiences. And as I mentioned, I've been able to maintain my day-to-day job, but also go on these international deployments periodically. And I've been very, very fortunate to have a lot of people interested in mentoring me and hearing my ideas for how I want to move forward in my career. So um, I would encourage Portuguese American students out there to, to consider public service. I think I can speak from the experience of being an immigrant child that we see some of the struggles that immigrants face. And so I think a lot of us might be sort of interested in public service because of that. So I I think the public sector is a good way to go amongst the other, you know, potential organizations and agencies that you could work for. I see also that one of your uh, areas of volunteering is with Toastmasters, and um, that's something that a lot of Portuguese Americans aren't involved in. Unfortunately, sometimes we limit ourselves to volunteering at the local club hall or something like that. Of course, uh, with your experience in the mainstream society and having lived in different uh, areas of the United States, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Toastmasters and what made you get involved with them. So I think I'm sort of the black sheep in my family amongst my cousins and even my sister in that. I'm one of the few that has moved out of southern New England and has really tried to live in different places in the U.S. and countries. Um, So one of the things that has helped me do that is actually my involvement in Toastmasters. So I would say that as a child, I was very introverted and I'm still an introvert. And so I was very nervous about public speaking and kind of nervous about speaking one-on-one with people in general, like in the classroom. I was a very good student, but I was pretty quiet. And so as as I started um, presenting more in graduate school and then in my career, I realized that I really wanted to become a more effective communicator one-on-one with people and also like interpersonal communication, but also with public speaking. And so um, when I first started working with CDC, I joined the CDC Toastmasters group and that was very helpful. But the bulk of my um, Toastmasters experience has been, was with the club in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, and then a club that I've been a member with here that's not at CDC. It's um, it's not a, a work-related club. But Toastmasters is just a, a really comfortable environment to practice public speaking. Everybody there is focused on their own personal development. They're very encouraging of your speaking. And you really work on some concrete skills related to communication. So you have someone that will evaluate your speech, someone that will time your speech, someone that will count those those pesky filler words like, um, like, so. I think they kind of ruined me because anytime I hear a presentation now, at work or elsewhere. I count all the filler words. But (laughs) I also learn something every time I go to a meeting. So I learn about whatever people speak about. So different topics that I might not learn about through my everyday life or through work. So for me, I found it to be very helpful. They definitely helped me um, stop doing some things that were distracting when I was speaking. Like I would move my hands frantically. I would use filler words a lot more than I do now. And I'm a lot less nervous around public speaking than I used to be and actually seek out opportunities to speak now. And I've noticed being in the workplace, especially at CDC, that it doesn't matter how good you are at your craft or your science. If you can't communicate it effectively, then Mm -hmm. it really you know, it really might not have the impact that you want it to. So um, it's been something that I continue to work on. And I have found that Toastmasters was a really great way to, to work on it. 
You mentioned also the, as you uh, said, the black sheep of the family moving away from what is, you know, uh, a, a very heavy Portuguese American community in your case, in in uh, Rhode Island and, and Massachusetts, and we have them, as you know, throughout the East Coast and here as well in California. Mm -hmm. But as 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 immigrants, uh, as 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 the our immigration has ceased, as you know, from uh, Portugal and from the islands, as immigration ceases, and you know, uh, Portuguese Americans of first and second generation get involved, that happens a lot more, but. Many people, sometimes it does happen that you stick around, you stick around for family reasons or you stick around because of uh, kind of a safety net that you have, you know, comfortable the, out of your, it's a little bit hard to get out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. What prompted you to actually get out of uh, of this uh, very comfortable area where all of your family was? So my mom always wonders that because I used to be very shy and attached to her and she doesn't quite understand what happened. But I think one of the things is I've always been very curious and I've always loved learning. And so um, because I was interested in learning about other cultures and places, that really prompted me to, to get out and to travel. I think also because I was very shy and introverted, I almost tried to kind of face those fears by getting out there and exposing myself to different people and to different places. And so by doing that more and more, I figured out that I liked it. So that's kind of how I, I went about it. But, um, you know, it, it is challenging. Like I live in Atlanta and there aren't many Portuguese people at all here. I found like two Portuguese restaurants and unfortunately they're not very good. Um, well, you're, you're spoiled coming from where you're from as far as Portuguese yes, restaurants, correct? I am, yeah, but I try to, you know, keep keep up my culture as much as I can. So I, I talk to my family regularly. Um, I actually started a, a, an informal Portuguese group at CDC where we get together and speak in Portuguese. Most people speak Brazilian Portuguese, but it's still the, the same language. And then any opportunity I get to talk to people about Portugal or send them an itinerary of places to go there. I try to do that. Uh, it is challenging to maintain my culture, not being in a place with other Portuguese people, but I try to do it as much as I can. And I feel like my worldview has really expanded by living in different places and traveling, and I wouldn't trade any of that. Sure. And you also mentioned the part about your work in Minnesota at the local uh, government level. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we've tried through the various organizations that focus on that, uh, such as Palcus Nationally, is getting more and more Portuguese Americans to get involved in, in, in state and local governments. Because, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of the decisions are made at the local level, yeah. whether it be having Portuguese on a, in a school because there's a Portuguese person on the school board. Tell us a little bit uh, from your experience working in local government, how important it is to have a voice in local government where there are Portuguese Americans uh, communities? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I can't really speak exactly to the Portuguese experience, but when I was in Minnesota, there are a lot of Somali refugees and there are a lot of Hmong refugees there. And I, Minnesota in particular is very, very community oriented. And so I saw there how important it was to, um, to have people from those cultures be, be represented in local and state government. I think uh, Minneapolis recently just selected their first Somali uh, woman um, mm -hmm. council member. I can also speak from my sister's experience. So my sister actually works in um, Fall River, Massachusetts. She's a school psychologist and um, she speaks Portuguese as well. And she speaks Spanish and she is always called on to do bilingual assessments. And she talks a lot about, you know, the struggles that some of the, the kids face. And so I can see how it would be so important to have a Portuguese American or Puerto Rican, um, for example, on a city council to advocate um, for their needs. So you in Minneapolis, you saw this firsthand. I mean, yep. these 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 uh, communities, you know, had uh, much uh, better services if they had representation. Oh, for sure. Yep. Okay. And sort of getting to that point, and getting back to the work that you do at the CDC in particular, not only encouraging people to run for office, but let's say somebody locally wanted to do something to help with reducing sodium, or something else that you might be working on that the CDC might be working on. 
First, how does one find out about the work that the CDC is doing? And if they wanted to contribute or participate in some way, what would you recommend, right? Do we, do we write a letter to our school board saying, hey, you need to reduce the sodium? Do we write a letter to, or do we go to a meeting? Or is there like local committees? How does one support some of the initiatives that you guys are working on from mm-hmm. a health perspective? Um, because that's something that we want to encourage people to do as well. If, if they don't want to run for office, right, but if they wanted to do something else, how would they help with the, the work that you're doing? Right. So CDC is kind of unique in that we're a federal agency. So even though we're located in, in Georgia, we can't really like favor Georgia over any other state. But with that said, I think there are still definitely things that local and state communities can do. So I think one thing that I learned when I started working for a federal government is a lot of executive branch federal agencies, basically what they are are funders for state and local governments. So uh, CDC, one of our main roles, in addition to putting out data, we fund state and local health departments and organizations to do work. So I think one way that communities can get involved is to look for funding opportunities from CDC to to do um, public health work. But then also um, CDC does, and I'm hoping, you know, some of the listeners have seen some of this stuff, but we do have really excellent communication campaigns. Um, We have a Facebook page and Instagram. Uh, We always put out health communication information. So getting some of that information out through people's um, social media pages would be helpful. And I think like, you know, say you're in a community here in Georgia and something's going on in your community that could be dangerous for people's health. Every community is associated with a health department or a health district. For example, Georgia, we have county health departments, we have the Georgia State Health Department, um, and they're pretty accessible um, by the web and just calling people. I think also, um, Like you mentioned, this is kind of my community member hat here, but your elected officials like to hear what's going on in the community and that helps them make decisions. Um, So they're also interested in in what's going and keeping their community healthy. So I think there's a lot of ways that people can get involved in promoting health and, and making elected officials and other people aware of what's going on. Excellent. And um, so I know that you you grew up in a Portuguese community and you spoke Portuguese. And did you grow up thinking, I want to actively, you know, consciously think, I want to use Portuguese in my career? Or did you just happen to notice that, hey, I speak Portuguese, I could probably take advantage of that opportunity. And then it just sort of went from there. Um, and, and my point with the question is trying to encourage more people to take, more students to take Portuguese as a language, or even as an adult, if you don't speak Portuguese, um, you know, try to learn the language. So can you talk a little bit about how, how knowing Portuguese, the language, is, um, as well as being exposed to other, I guess, being exposed to your heritage, you said opened you up to other cultures, how that helped your career, you know, and open doors? Sure. So I actually have a few regrets related to that. So I I grew up um, speaking Portuguese at home and I went to, they had a Portuguese school in Rhode Island. So I went for a year, but I wish I actually had studied Portuguese more. I went into Spanish because I thought, you know, more people speak Spanish and it could be more useful for my career. But my parents are also always very adamant about us knowing how to speak Portuguese. So um, we spoke it at home and it helped me. I think it really helped me learn Spanish. If you know how to speak Portuguese um, and you study Spanish, you can get into it very easily. I think it was kind of like, oh, you know, I'm focusing on Spanish. If a Portuguese opportunity comes up, great. But I think probably like five or six years ago, I became more and more interested in connecting more with my heritage and improving my Portuguese and making sure that I continued to speak it. And so I really made it a goal to work in Portuguese. I really wanted that opportunity. So actually, when I was in Minnesota, I joined uh, like a Portuguese meetup group. And so I worked on the language um, when I was there. And then 
at CDC, I've had two opportunities to work in Spanish uh, in Portuguese, excuse me. Um, so I was in Angola for a month working on an, a yellow fever outbreak. And then in Mozambique, where my dad actually grew up for most of his um, life, his young life. So I was there for a month for a polio outbreak. And it just felt great that I was able to work you know, in another group of countries. Um, and actually, I'm one of the few people at the agency that speaks Portuguese. So I know that if something goes on in a Portuguese speaking country, I'll likely um, be tapped to help out. And it's not just, you know, the countries in Africa, but they were doing something for with Brazil, and they asked me if I could participate. So now I feel so fortunate that I grew up speaking Portuguese. And I think, it not only helped me learn Spanish, but it also enabled me to to work in Portuguese speaking countries and um, to help other people uh, learn Portuguese at work at the agency as well. Just a quick follow up on that, Nancy. One of the things that you mentioned also early on was, you know, your uh, and uh, your parents and and living in a uh, in an area that's you know very uh, present with Portuguese heritage. How important would you say, not just the language, but also knowing the heritage and you know being in the Portuguese community, how important was that to opening up to other cultures, especially in the Latin American countries that you've been involved with? Sure. I think it always, you know, I grew up sometimes feeling like a little different than like the typical American kid or like having immigrant parents who you know, we were always fine, but my parents had to work a lot. And so I felt like I could connect a lot better to kids that, um, and even now to people that came from another cultural background or whose parents were immigrants. And so I think growing up with the other culture made me gravitate toward people that also grew up with another culture. And then I got involved in undergrad uh, working with immigrants and refugees as a volunteer. And so um, having my parents being immigrants always like made me gravitate towards those communities. And there's a lot of Latino immigrants in um, New England and I was studying Spanish. So it all kind of um, made sense. But I really attribute growing up as a Portuguese kid to me really being interested in, in other cultures. And I really thank my dad for, my parents worked a lot and they didn't really know which activities to put us in and that sort of thing, but he always brought us to the library. And so um, I loved reading and I was a shy kid. So reading was kind of my outlet to the world. And so that was another thing that made me really interested in learning, curious about other places and other people. That's great. I think it's a great message. And um, I, I hope that everyone listening will encourage those uh, students in their lives to, to enroll in Portuguese where possible. And if there isn't a class, uh, Denise and I know this all too well, that we're, we're working diligently to, to try and establish Portuguese language courses in, in areas that are lacking them. So um, I think your I think your example is an, an excellent one for people to follow um, where, you know, learning Portuguese, even over Spanish is, is can be more advantageous in, in many cases. So. And, and also, if I may, might add, uh, uh, thanks also for sharing that important aspect that we can be empathetic, you know, toward others because of this heritage and mm -hmm. this experience that we've had with our own parents. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, we've come up on our time and this has been a really great conversation and very insightful. Nancy, thank you so much for reaching out to us. And I, I hope our listeners uh, enjoyed hearing about your career path and have been inspired to get involved. And if anybody has any questions about the CDC or, or anything like that, uh, where should they go? Uh, who could they contact? Um, so they could go to www.cdc.gov and then I'd be happy to talk to folks too, but CDC has a pretty robust website and we also have Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter. So I'd encourage folks to, to look there and um, yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. And I hope that um, people found this helpful. And I think uh, I would just say to any young Portuguese Americans out there, there's so many different career paths you can take and um, don't be afraid to leave home. Uh, you can always go. <laughs> And kudos to you, and thanks, and I'm sure that every Portuguese-American listening out there, non-Portuguese-American, are proud of your work, and uh, I think you're a fine and uh, most uh, 
exciting example for Portuguese Americans um, all over the United States. You know, thanks you, thanks for your work and thanks for what you have done to outreach to other uh, Portuguese American uh, communities and also your outreach to these Portuguese speaking countries, uh, whether it be in Angola and Mozambique, and your important work at uh, SCDC. It is it is so important to have Portuguese Americans diversify into these fields of knowledge. Thank you so much and kudos to you. Absolutely. And thank you everybody out there for listening and spending another half an hour with us um, learning about uh, another successful Portuguese American in public service. If you have not hit subscribe to Politicus, please click that subscribe button now. Share this podcast with friends and family and anybody that you think would be interested. And if you can, take a minute or so and write us a review on iTunes. It actually goes a long way in terms of helping others find us uh, when they're looking for podcasts related to the Portuguese community. And with that, uh, we'll say have a wonderful day and thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Politicus, the official podcast of PALCUS, the Portuguese American Leadership Council of the United States. PALCUS is the premier national organization representing the interests of the Portuguese American community at large. To learn more about PALCUS and how to become a member or to make a donation, visit www.palcus.org. To submit feedback or suggestions about the podcast, email us at palcus at palcus.org. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests of the show are not endorsed by Palcus.